everyone. My name is Sona. And my name is Sweetie. And welcome to What, what They, they Don't, Don't Tell You podcast. podcast. The Presento Edition. So today is going to be a kind of a scary topic. Yeah, today we're going to talk about finances. finances. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's such a scary topic. I think because we're talking big money here. It's not yeah. like little pocket change. These are a huge life changing mm -hmm. debt you're getting yourself into. Yeah, it's one of those moments where some people go through school and they do well and then they get here and they're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> I think also it deters a lot of people from like even going to college because that is yeah. such a scary amount of debt and people go directly into the workforce. So I think we need to do what we need to do for yeah. our field. <laughs> but not all debt is bad debt. I'll mm. just say it like that. True. Because you buy a house, you owe that. and. Then mm. you it just is what it is at that point. So we do want to talk about how we went about financial aid or finances when we were in undergrad versus graduate school and then now pursuing dental school. Mm -hmm. So to get started, I guess we can get into undergrad when you're filling out FOSFA. There's two types of loans. The first one is direct subsidized loans. Mm -hmm. And that's like the best thing you can get for an undergraduate. That is specific to undergraduates only. You don't get that after your four years, but that has the lowest interest rate. Mm. And I believe it's at 4.99%, which is like really low for yeah. a college loan. You don't have to pay it back until after like you're done mm -hmm. so i think it's, it's six months after yep you're not in school anymore after you're graduated from college mm -hmm. undergrad you have six months deferment period and that's when the interest starts accumulating yeah versus direct unsubsidized so yeah direct unsubsidized has the higher interest rate mm -hmm. at 6.54 percent but the interest rate starts as soon as the loan is acquired yep <laughs> yikes and that's for undergrad and grad as well as grad yeah. yes so that would be some of the obvious differences the interest rate what it applies to so undergrad and graduate for unsubsidized mm -hmm. and subsidized is only for undergrad I did community college for a few years. When I moved to Florida, I didn't know that there was like out-of-state tuition and mm. state tuition. So when I applied and I finally came here, I came across like a little bit of an issue. Financial aid covered my financial aid for in-state, but mm. then I had to pay the difference for out-of-state. Mm. And based on the school I was at, I was at Miami-Dade, so it wasn't that much. But at the time, I had to literally work. Mm. to pay for the semester and then take the following semester off so I can pay for the next one. And then I did that for a year. So I didn't accumulate too much loans mm -hmm. during my community college time. But when I went to FIU mm -hmm. is when I went through both subsidized and unsubsidized. And I ended up maxing out because you can max out. Right. So there is a cap those. for these too. Yeah. So based on some of the research that I did, the maximum federal Pell Grant for 2023 and 2024, it's 7395 hmm. I think at one point it was like 10000 I think when I was in school, yes, yeah. it was like 10000 yeah. So that is a cap every year mm -hmm. as much as you can take out. So exactly. that is another con for these subsidized loans, I believe. It is lower amounts of money that mm -hmm. you are receiving. So when you were an undergrad, how did you go? Because I know you went to a private school, and that's mm -hmm. also different because you have in-state, out-of-state, and then you have private. Right. So private is basically everyone's out-of-state. There is no in-state <laughs> discount tuition. But it is obviously a lot more money than mm -hmm. a community college would be or an in-state institution would be. I filled out the FAFSA. I also received both direct unsubsidized as well as subsidized loans. Yeah, and, and that's then, based on income. That Actually, no. I don't think no. subsidized are. So subsidized is not based on income. Mm -hmm. Unsubsidized is based is. on income? Yes. Okay. Because I know when you're a dependent, that's another thing. When you're a dependent versus when you're not, some of the things changes too. When you're applying, make sure that you pay attention to those details. Like if you're a dependent versus not being. Mm -hmm. And some of the questions vary and then how much you get also changes. Mm -hmm. So do your yeah. research. <laughs> <laughs> to cover the rest of my expenses, I use the Parent PLUS loan. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of loan which has higher interest rates, but you can ask for any amount, Yeah, which is a double-edged sword. Be realistic. Yeah. <laughs> and responsible. Yes. Yes. Like, don't ball out. <laughs> <laughs> or you can, but realize interest is accruing and you will have to pay that back. Yeah. Don't forget that you have to pay these loans back. So be mindful when 
you do take out. I only did FOSFA, like the Pell Grant, the unsubsidized subsidized Mm -hmm. for undergrad. But then when I started grad school, Mm -hmm. I already maxed out. I was an undergrad for a long time. Right. So when I finally got to Barry, financial aid covered maybe like 40 to 60% of whatever classes I was taking, whatever that amount was. And Mm -hmm. then I had to apply for a grad plus loan. And that I did it through FOSFA versus Mm -hmm. when there's private loans like Sally May May. or like these little like banks. Banks. So Mm -hmm. those are private. The interest rates are higher Mm -hmm. and they do run your credit. Mm -hmm. The Reg Plus loan did run my credit too. Mm -hmm. And if you're not building your credit, there's tons of resources out there for you to learn how to acquire credit. Because sometimes I know that having credit cards and having a credit helped me even acquiring those loans. Mm. I thought for yeah. undergrads, you're not really like well-versed about credit cards and yeah. like having a credit score. So I would look into that. Start learning about that now. Don't wait late. Like mm-hmm. I did at least. Definitely learn about that. Learn about credit because some of the loans that you do take out, they will pull your credit for. Mm. What are the federal loans usually capped at? Because I don't remember. I just know that they were like, you have maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> On all your loans. Yeah. For FAFSA specifically... $47,167. And that is your cap federally every year that you can get in these direct unsubsidized loans. Mm-hmm. That is your cap. Let's talk about what's happening now. Because mm-hmm. obviously I had undergrad loans. I took another federal loan for Barry, which is roughly around 30 k mm. And now we're going to dental school. So now we're talking really, really big loans. Talking big money. <laughs> <laughs> big money. So I want to talk about a cost of attendance for a dental school. Obviously, we know this is a lot of money we're talking, but like way more than even a private institution for college. I happen to be going to the same exact school I went to undergrad, and the tuition difference is just huge. So where are you going to school, Sana? <laughs> <laughs> we are attending Boston University Golden School of Dental Medicine. So I'm going to break down some of the numbers for the 23-24 year. Don't get scared, but it's very (laughs) nerve-wracking seeing these huge numbers. But to be honest, it's going to be like all across the board. It's all going to be, yeah. Yeah. So just refer back to our criteria video Mm -hmm. and it'll help you navigate through like... Right. Understanding what's important for you. Don't think about that too much. Like, focus on other things. It should be a part of your criteria right. when choosing. Because, for example, if you do get in-state, like, that is half the tuition. Yeah. I think it's really important to know. If you're not in private. Right. All of my schools were private. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> let's talk about it. Yeah. So, the tuition, just tuition alone for the next school year, is going to be $91,500. <laughs> And that is tuition for D1 year. Let's just sit Ooh. on that for a second. $91,500 for the first year. Tuition only. So that does not include materials. Mm-mm. That doesn't include insurance. That doesn't include transportation. <laughs> that doesn't include living. Mm-hmm. So when you get accepted and you get all these like forms, they send you your cost of attendance, which is like an estimated version of how much money they think you will spend. Mm -hmm. But they do have things such as you mentioned, transportation, food, personal. They throw that in there just so you have a gist of how much you should ask from these loan companies. There is also other criteria on there, which you won't be paying that first year. For example, boards. So boards Mm -hmm. you do D3, D4 year. So that's going to be zero for the first two years. So something also to keep in mind, like it will change every year how much money you ask for the loan. So you have to kind of recalculate that every year because it will be a little different. Pro tip, health insurance. When they give you this cost of attendance, they like zero that out already, meaning they assume you have health insurance, but you have to make sure you fill out that waiver before you start. So for me, it's going to be in July to make sure they do zero that out because otherwise they will charge you. They will charge you. Yeah. (laughs) You think you're getting a refund and <laughs> <laughs> gone. <laughs> right. When I got into Barry, I did the financial aid regular loan and then I still had like two or three thousand I was responsible for. Mm-hmm. So the direct plus loan helped pay for that and whatever was left I was able to use to not work for the semester. Right. So to pay for some of my expenses and just to get to school and Mm -hmm. come back so it made it so much easier for me to not have to work and focus completely in school that's something that you know you're worried about like oh man i might have to work definitely look into a grad plus loan and or the parent plus loan Mm -hmm. 
Also, I think they really recommend not working during dental school. Like, it's yeah. very ill advised. Like, I don't think it's. I don't even think it's possible. Like I, I know some people like do like coaching or like tutoring yeah. or little odd jobs, but most students that I've spoken to, I'm pretty sure you've spoken mm-hmm. to. Like, we all depend on the loans to be able to kind of survive. Function. And they mm-hmm. know that. That's why when they give you these, like, cost of attendance forms, they incorporate food, personal fees, housing. They know you're most likely not going to work. And even if you do, it's not going to make a dent yeah. in this huge sums of money. Mm-hmm. So take the loan. <laughs> Interest yeah. is going to accumulate. Pay and attention could, to it. If you could stay home and save a little bit, definitely stay home. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to save. So, mm-hmm. for example, down in South Florida, I have a car. But I'm selling that because I know the next city I'm going to be in, the fees just don't make sense to mm. keep a car. I'll be switching to public transportation. <laughs> they get do what you can. Yeah, this is all about the commitment and making sacrifices. So mm-hmm. at least you'll be saving car payment, which is like $600, <laughs> car dollars insurance. Car payment, car insurance, mm-hmm. and parking. Yeah. And you can use that to actually like just pay for food and just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, your everyday things. Don't be afraid of playing around like what you can sacrifice versus what you can't. For example, I know housing, a lot of people are getting roommates and having sometimes three roommates to a two bedroom. Personally, I know that wasn't something I could sacrifice. Living on my own, I just know I needed that space, especially if I want to do well, you know, academically and just like my own mental health. I decided to sacrifice the transportation part versus like housing. So the insurance, you have to make sure that you sign the waiver, either get insurance outside of school or get the insurance that they provide. There's housing, there's food, there's books, personal expenses, transportation, board. So at the end of the first year, what is an estimate for Mm -hmm. the school? The estimated total for my school, we're going to pop it up right there. So roughly 140K for one year of dental school. One out of four. (laughs) <laughs> one out of four we are talking an interest rate of 6.54 percent the minute that loan is dispersed like that's going to start accumulating <laughs> don't let that stop you <laughs> you have to do what you got to do yeah it's, it'll be worth it it's very intimidating but i think every dentist i've talked to have mm-hmm. talked about there's so many different repayment plans after you do graduate and obviously, we're investing in our futures. It's a great career. You will make mm. the money back. <laughs> you have to be smart about it. But also, there is other like scholarships some people do. There are a lot of scholarships. Mm-hmm. I'm not really versed in mm-hmm. how to even approach it. So it's something that I definitely want to learn about mm-hmm. in the near future. Because I know, personally, I'm going to need as much help as I can. Because mm-hmm. it's, it's tough, you know? Mm-hmm. And I know I can't work. Right. I do want to touch on the two major scholarships for dental school specifically. So um, the first one is the HPSP, which is the Health Profession Scholarship Program. And that's with the Army, Navy, and Air Force. So this is super popular for a lot of people. But I heard it's kind of picky. They're choosy Mm -hmm. of who actually gets in. And I looked into the application process, which is very lengthy. (laughs) And another application. (laughs) Application after application. (laughs) But I think for those, just read the clauses. Because I know personally, I wasn't comfortable signing off on something. So the whole premises of this loan is they pay for your full four years. Then after that, they get you for four years. And Mm -hmm. that means any kind of base, any location, you don't have a say. And I feel like I don't know what's going to happen, right? Next. And that was like too unknown for me. So that's like a great option for someone who's interested. And I've heard nothing but great things, but... Personally, it's a no. Not for me. <laughs> no, I'm good. I remember telling my mom, I was like, hey, mom, because when I was in FIU, they were always, not recruiting, but they were always mm. there. And I thought about it. Mm. My mom was just like, no. Because she was just like, <laughs> army, war. Like, she wasn't yeah. thinking, like, you know, this could help. And I, I freaked out, and I just didn't go through mm. with it, which I'm kind of glad now because I got a chance to mm. learn about other avenues. Right. Do what's good for you. Yep. <laughs> the second really popular one, which is the NHSC SP, which is the National Health Service Corp Scholarship. So very similar to the Army one, you must commit the same amount of years that they cover your loans. You only covered it for two years. You'd only have served two years. The difference is this one, you serve in an underserved community. They call it health professional shortage areas. So these are going to be the offices that are like the Medicaid, Medicare, government assistance Mm -hmm, programs. Mm -hmm. 
I like the idea of this one because you don't have to commit fully for four years. Okay, you can do it for like two. Right, like you can apply one. any year. So I can yeah. like do first D one year and see if that like sounds like a good idea and then decide if I want to apply for it a certain yeah. year. I think it's also good because you get to gain experience. You get to work with more people and just learn more and get mm -hmm. more experience. Yeah. So that's that's a plus because you would do that if you did a residency program. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So. Exactly. My question is, which I want to learn more about and hopefully tell you guys once I find out, is what kind of procedures will you be doing? Because mm -hmm. I feel like when you are working in an underserved area, I would assume it's very bread and butter. So it would be like fillings and the basic things, but mm -hmm. I doubt you would do these big, I don't know. I just don't see yeah. like an implant happening. I don't really see like that many root canals or crowns or bridges. Yeah. So. I know for some offices that are Medicaid, root canals are only covered on certain teeth. If they're under a certain age, it's covered. Mm -hmm. So it's, it depends. So Right. So you're following mm -hmm. government rules too. Exactly. Which I think would... I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but I know some people that do residency and they do the government stuff, but would you be able to work? Like, let's say you're working full time at this one office doing Medicaid, but then you can work at a private office or a specialty. I don't or think something. you could. No. Oh. I think they have you signed for like however many years that mm. you have. You can only work with their like facilities. Okay. Mm. It's still a really great option. Again, if they're covering this yeah. much, it's a really great option. <laughs> so now that you did the financial aid, for dental school, mm -hmm. how did you calculate or budget in like your necessities and like mm -hmm. everything you're gonna need when you start in July? Yeah, this was like tricky. So like I said earlier, so FAFSA covered like roughly 47,000, okay. 47,000 out of 140K. Next, that amount is what I owe or roughly would need. So luckily for me, I do have savings. I do have parents helping me. So I tried to figure out the perfect amount number to ask for to cover some of like the major stuff. So I want to make sure, for example, tuition's completely covered. Mm -hmm. So I made sure like that amount for sure I got from the loan. But other things, for example, like housing or personal needs, like that's, I don't know yet. I won't mm -hmm. know until like living there. For those things, I didn't put... Like for the grad plus loan. Like you haven't budgeted for yet. Right. Okay. Yet. So I think for me, I'm going to see how D1 year plays out. Yeah. So I guess for my approach, when I start that process, I would include like rent. Depending on the city that I'm in, I probably will have a car or not. Budgeting, like eating in and mm. groceries and stuff like that. Oh. I feel like it's so tough to budget too, though. I feel like you have to start now. How much do you yeah. spend on like eating out, groceries, mm -hmm. things like yeah. that? And I think it's good. Like I know I have a sell sheet where mm -hmm. I literally write everything that I spend so that I know where I'm getting crazy and mm -hmm. what areas I'm like being crazy. They have apps I, for that too, right? Yeah, but even your bank. Mm -hmm. For example, I have Bank of America and it'll categorize mm -hmm. everything that I've spent and it'll show me like you spent highest here. Right. Or this month you went over this. Like mm -hmm. you can set budgets. Like there's so many different resources for that. You really just have to do your research. Another thing I think we should be aware about is when you do ask for a certain amount on these graduate plus loans, there is a loan like asking fee. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like I made a payment for, I think I paid something for the IRS mm -hmm. and they charged me a processing fee. Right. For paying. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, how am I paying to pay? <laughs> like, yeah. That's crazy. So they charge you a fee for, for, asking for asking the loan, for getting the loan. So something to keep in mind when you are making these budgets and calculating how much, because I know, for example, like I did some numbers and I wanted to ask for, let's say 75,000. Mm -hmm. So the percentage that they, that they charging to give you the loan, is taken out of that 75. Right. So you want to estimate higher than that. higher than that so that when they take out their percentage, mm -hmm. you still have the amount that you requested. Exactly. So when I first originally put 75,000, the end up loan I received ended up being 72. Okay. So it's roughly So like then you have 4, to 000. like ask for a little bit more. So yeah, that means next, yeah, I would have to ask for like 78 mm -hmm. in order to get 75. So I have to play with these numbers a bit too, which is yeah. the process I'm doing right now, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, the more you know, the better, because mm -hmm. then you can make more educated decisions versus like making mistakes and then like trying to figure it out later. Exactly. I mean, that's a takeaway from that. 
Do you have any tips for budgeting in general? What do you do out here? For budgeting? So when I was applying for the direct loan, they're like, oh, you just ask for how much you mm -hmm. want. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a lot. So what I did is I looked at how much I have to pay monthly. Mm -hmm. So for where I live, I bought a used car, so I don't have car payments, but I do have to pay for car insurance. Mm -hmm. So I budgeted how much it would cost me for six months. Because, you know, you get it per semester. Right. So I would pay my insurance for six months. How much would that be? Then I budget in, you know, how much I eat. I know I'm small, but I eat a lot. <laughs> so I would budget in, you know, how much it would cost me to go food shopping in the places that I do go food shop. Hmm. Making certain sacrifices. Like, okay, if I go shopping in Publix, I know it's a little bit more expensive. So I'll go to like Aldi or somewhere more cost efficient. Gas. If I put gas on Monday and I put $40, I'll add it to my sheet. Just really paying attention to every single detail. Like if you buy a new shirt or if you buy scrubs or something for mm -hmm. shadowing or if you have to do anything outside, like traveling, if you're not home. Like for me, I have to take into account also going home once a month or every three months, mm -hmm. how much that will cost. So it's very tedious. If you still haven't started yet and you're watching this, you already have a head start. Like You already have that mm -hmm. mindset. So just start paying attention to everything that you spend. And really look at what is not necessary. What are your needs versus like your wants? Exactly. And be mindful of that. I think a good tool is just like keep your receipts for a month. And just like see, because sometimes like I don't even realize. I know I did that last month just trying to see like, hey, where am I spending a lot of money? Mm. And like Starbucks every week. There's so no need well, for that. <laughs> right. So you, if you have to buy oh. things at home, do the most that you can at home. And then you can have separate fun for like... A dinner, maybe, if you mm -hmm. want to go out with friends. Make sure that you have everything organized. So I use Bank of America to help me with mm -hmm. that organization, as well as, like, my own little sheet. Mm -hmm. But you can look at your statements and pay attention to everything you purchase. Don't just spend frivolously. Like, you really want to pay attention to where your money goes at all times. Let's say I request $10,000. I have that $10,000 for the next five months, and that has to go into everything. And it sounds like a lot at first, but when you have rent and car payments and other things, it can go really fast. Like, like quick. And I learned that the first semester, I was all over the place, blowing through that fast mm -hmm. because I wasn't conscious of it. I was just like, okay, I can, I'm going to pay my rent for this amount of time. I'm going to do this and then I'll have this money. I just wasn't organized. Mm -hmm. So it took me like a little bit of a panic moment when I was like, oh my God, I have to pay for this class and I didn't even save any. I don't have any kind of fallback plan like, so definitely be aware of where your money goes and pay attention to what are your absolute necessities versus just anything that you think you mm -hmm. want <laughs> hearing that i feel like also a lot of our younger viewers should know like start an emergency fund like as soon as possible because mm -hmm. i feel like the minute i started having that cushion like, I will feel like I will never have a moment like that. You relax. Yeah. yeah. Like, I remember you used to tell me, like, sweetie, you're literally in survival mode. Like, yeah. remember, I have an old car. So I also have to keep in mind, like, when my car breaks down, that's sudden expenses. 400 $500. Yep. And now that comes out of my reserve. Mm -hmm. And now I have to think, like, okay, well, if I just came out of pocket for that, that means I have to scale back on something. It's rough. Mm -hmm. But it's doable. Once I learn to manage, hold myself accountable, and just be honest about your relationship with money, mm -hmm. I think you're already on the right track. It's a relationship for life. This is really, gets like, like better and like, better. This yeah. is like a long-term relationship. <laughs> so it's better to learn how to manage it now so that when you get out, you know you're going to have all this debt. You're going to get a job. You're probably not going to make crazy amounts the first few years, but mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you get those habits in place before you get out there. But don't forget, there is repayment options. Yeah. And there's certain programs where, like forgive all your loans after working for 10 years. Like there's mm -hmm. certain things out there for us. So don't get so intimidated by those big numbers. Yeah. Like, don't let that stop you. Just yeah. learn more. Always different ways to go about these things. Like, you're mm -hmm. not the first one. You won't be the last one. And, you know, as a minority, I can relate to being afraid of money mm -hmm. when it comes to those things. But once you just learn how to manage it and understand that this is an investment, I think mm -hmm. that your approach will be very different. Wow. So I hope you guys enjoy this. If you guys want to connect with us, Go ahead and comment below if you have any questions. We'd love to, you know, learn more too if you know any 
loopholes or anything or any scholarship <laughs> programs or anything like that, please let us know below. Mm -hmm. We're always eager to learn more, mm -hmm. especially since we're going through this in real like right now. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great to learn more and even you know give back more if we do. So I hope you guys love this video. Make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, comment below, and hit the bell notification to know every time that we post. And all of our social media will be linked down below. And we will see you in our next video. Bye. Bye, guys.